I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Glad to see each and every one of your smiling faces. It's a good crowd here tonight, amen? Let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him for another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Come to thank Him and praise Him and magnify Him for everything He's done. He's a mighty God, amen? amen. If we have any prayer requests tonight, just let them be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. And while we're praying, let's pray for our pastor, too, that God will bless him and strengthen him while he's at general conference. Give him a word and pour back into him what he's been pouring into us. Amen? Amen. I know he's able to do it. So let's go before the Lord tonight, can we? God, we magnify you. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for another opportunity to be in your house. Lord, you see every need that was in this place. God, every hand that was raised, whether it's sickness, God, marital, financial, whatever the need might be, Lord, you're able to touch each and every one of them. I pray, God, your hand of mercy and your hand of grace upon every person that made it in this place tonight. God, those that are watching online, whoever the situation may be, I pray, God, that you touch them, that you strengthen them, that you encourage them, that you bless them, God, and that you prepare them, each and every one of them, oh, Lord, to go out from this place. God, that they will glean from your word tonight that they will glean and worship tonight, Lord, and they will leave this place ready and prepared, God, for the harvest that you've set before us. I pray, God, that you bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us, and we're going to magnify you. We're going to praise you, and we're going to bless you, for you are truly worthy of our praise, O oh God, and we magnify you in this place tonight. And the church said, amen. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise tonight and magnify the Lord. Without your love, slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross, 
Come on, let's worship the Lord in the house tonight. He is worthy of our praise. We magnify you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for you are worthy. Come on, one more moment. Just praise the Lord in this place. Magnify him. He is worthy of our praise. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. You are worthy, O oh God. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. You may be seated in the house tonight. I'm thankful for what I feel in this place. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been kind of watching a little bit of the general conference videos in the nighttime, laying there in the bed watching them. And as we was watching them the other day, one of the ministers began to talk about the harvest. And I couldn't help but think about Sunday of what God had gave me. And I was like, wow. Thank you, Lord, because that let me know, Brother David, that I ain't the only one realizing that there's a harvest, that something is happening in this place, and we got to be ready, amen? We got to be ready, and we got to be prepared to reach people. And I thank God, I thank God for the ability to enter into this place, to glean from his word, and to take it out to tell somebody else how good God is in my life, amen? What a mighty God we serve, and I'm thankful for one more opportunity. In this place tonight. Sister Scarlett, if you would, would you put the ways to give on the board? We have different ways to give here at the River Bend. We have GiveLify, which is my favorite, personally. We have PayPal available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can send your cash or checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Amen. We also have the wooden pans, which are for your tithing or your offering, and the gold pans for your tithing. So if you would tonight, everybody stand. We're going to repeat this prayer. I believe this prayer works, and I know I've said it all the time. It's not a magical prayer, but it does work because it's faith in what God is going to do. Amen? It's believing that he is able, and I know he's able because he's done it in my life. So if you would, repeat it with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, Gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. And everything that I do is going to prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Come tonight and give of what God has blessed you with.
Amen. You may be seated in the house. There's no truer statement. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. All we have to do is have just enough faith to let him have it. That's not always easy to do, Sister Maria. Sometimes we want to hang on to it, hang on to our own wants and our own desires. But you know what? When we learn through faith to give them to the Lord, he makes a way out of no way. And he leads us through the dark places. The Bible says he'll lead us through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. It ain't death, but sometimes it looks like it, Brother David. But he's going to lead us right on through it. Amen? I'm thankful for that. If we could have the Riverbend kids come tonight. We're going to allow them to go back for these great teachers that they have. Amen. It's a good group of kids we have right here. I know some of them wasn't able to be here tonight, but we got a good-looking little crowd. Brother Carson, you can lead them on back, buddy. Amen. River Bend Ignited. You can follow them on back. There's another good group of kids right there. Up and comers, we call them. Amen. I always heard that they're the church of tomorrow, but that's really not true. They're the church of right now. Amen. We need them. Young, old, it don't matter. We need everybody's hand in the harvest. Amen. And I believe they can reach kid people just like we can reach people. Sometimes even greater. We heard Sister Teresa's testimony Sunday morning. And that was a powerful testimony. Sit there rocking in a chair and a little baby began to tell her, you need to be at church. And guess where she's at? In church. Amen. That's a mighty testimony. I thank God for that. But tonight we're asking Brother David, he's coming. He's going to bring us the word. And I love Brother David. I love his teaching. And I know he has prepared something for us through the leading of the Spirit. Amen. So let's one more time as Brother David's coming, just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him. Thank you, Brother Larry. Amen, amen. I like what I feel here tonight. I had a miss Sunday morning, wasn't feeling too good, but I'm so glad to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. How many of you have your Bibles tonight? Amen. I'm going to talk to you about the Bible tonight. My lesson's entitled, God's Word, My Reflection. God's Word, Brother Cody, My Reflection on how I see myself and how others should see me. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, made visible in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I want to read it in the NIV version, and we're going to delve off into it. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and morals. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. He sees everything. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He sees everything. He knows everything. He sees us, Brother Donnie, as we are. There's no hiding from him. I want you to go to the Lord in prayer with me right now before I delve off any further because I definitely need his help tonight. Lord, I ask you, God, that you would lead and guide us. Lord, that you would help me, God, to explain your word. God, open your word up to somebody. God, open the eyes of someone's understanding, someone's heart to realize, God, that your word speaks, that your word is alive, God, that your word sets us free, God, that it sets us free from death, God. Lord, that your word is powerful, God. It's a weapon that we have that we can use, Lord. Help me, God, and lead and guide me and direct me in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. When we look at this passage of Scripture, Brother Shannon, that word quick does not mean speed. It does not mean move fast. It means that it's alive. That word quick means it gives life. 
to the believer. It opens it up and it gives life. It makes it to where we're alive. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, And ye hath the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, were dead to sin but alive in Jesus Christ. The Word of God. This. This right here quickens or resurrects us from the dead state of our sin. And it makes us alive, Brother Jerry. I've had people tell me that I, I read the Bible and I don't understand it. And I've been there. I've been through that. I know. Sometimes it only comes, Sister Maria, by prayer. That the Word would open up to us. Brother Larry, sometimes the minister will open up the Word to us. But it has the ability to make us alive, to become alive through His Word. John 1 1 and 2 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. When we look at that, and Brother Gio has, has taught us that. I want to talk to you about how the Word of God impacts our life when we allow it to. Sister Carolyn, that's a choice that I've got to make. That's a choice that I've got to say, hey, is the Word going to change me? Is the Word going to make a difference in my life? Or I'm just going to look at it and just go my way and be the same person that I am. Because it has the ability to do that if I make that choice. If I allow myself to decide that this Word is going to change my life, then it will happen. It will happen if I make that choice. Brother Gio quoted this, Genesis, or John 1 and 1, and, and, and a, a couple weeks ago. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God, and the same in the beginning, beginning was with God. And that speaks, when you, when you look at that and you delve off into it, that word means logos. And that word logos means that it is the mind of God. It's what God's thinking. When he created the universe, when he spoke it into existence, it was because of logos. It was the mind of God. That's what he wanted when he created creation, when he created man. That's how he's seen it. But it also can mean general word which is spoken to a congregation. We all take something different from it, Sister Rita. Or it can mean the rhema word. And that is a specific word that goes across this pulpit that's spoken to you directly. And it, it, it's amazing, and I'll, I'll cover it in just a minute, how that happens, how that takes place. John 1, 4, and 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And I begin to think about that, Brother Larry. I begin, to, I begin to break that down. Did you know that darkness is just the absence of light? Darkness is just the absence of light. When there's darkness and light enters the room, the darkness has to go. So darkness is just the absence of life. It says darkness comprehended it not. And that word comprehend means that it could not seize or that it could not take possession of the light because the light overpowered the darkness. When he came into the world and he was the life and he was the light to men, the darkness, the sin of that time could not overtake him. But Shannon, it, it could not comprehend him. It could not seize or take control of him because he was the light. And that's been passed on to us tonight. That's been passed on to each and every one of us. The Bible says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, your good attitude, your good actions, the words that you speak, how you act, and give glory to the Father which is in heaven. It's not about me, but it's about him when I do what the word says, when I allow that word to become real in my life. Jesus said in John 11, 25 and 26, he said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whatsoever liveth, or whosoever liveth, and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He gives life, and the life comes through the word. The life comes through him. This passage from Hebrews tells us that God's word diagnoses the condition of a man with a surgeon's precision. precision, It lays us open. It lets us see what's real. It lets us see what's going on within us. It's powerful and it exposes our weaknesses. And it exposes our unbelief like this. It demonstrates its power and its sharpness and its accuracies. Something happens when the word of God goes forth. 
because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I looked at it. It's to the point of getting into your innermost part. And it's discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It's the sword of the Spirit. When you look at Ephesians chapter 6, and it lists the weapons. It says, put on the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. All those are defensive weapons, but the only offensive weapon that we're given is the Word of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. It's what we fight with. It's what we have to battle the enemy with, and that's the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. It has the ability to cut into my heart, Sister Maria, and see who I really am. It constantly reminds us that we must submit ourselves to the will of God and to the Word of God. Now, Brother G.L. taught this to us, and he says there's things that happen when the Word goes forth. He says our feelings are provoked. Either it makes us mad, Brother Jerry, or it makes us want to change. But what happens when that Word is preached, when that Word goes forth, it brings us to a place of confrontation. It brings us to a place of confrontation with the divine will of God. Am I going to heed what the Word tells me? Am I going to heed what the Word does? Or am I going to let it go? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's our choice on how that we apply that to our life. Brother Cody, it's my choice on how that happens. When I'm brought to that confrontation with what the Word is telling me to do, with what that Word is asking me to do, the Word's asking me to change, am I willing to change? Am I willing to let it make a difference in my life? God's Word reaches with surprising precision in the Holy Ghost and powers, the ministry of the Word to work deeply in our hearts. Have you ever wondered how the preacher, whether it's Brother GL, whether it's Brother Larry, whether it's Brother Tripp, whoever it might be up behind this pulpit, speaks a word and goes forth, and you're thinking, Sister Leanne, you're thinking, how in the world do they know what's going on in my life? How is he speaking to me so plainly about the place that I'm living at right now and the things that I'm going through right now and the things that I'm talking about thinking about right now how does he know that has somebody been whispering in his ear has somebody been telling him that no it's because he's fallen on his knees and he's got in God's word and God's word has opened it up to him to speak to us the word makes a difference you're thinking how in the world man he 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 knows everything that I'm going through. He knows everything that I'm dealing with. That's that ream of word of God that speaks to me and lets me know that, hey, God loves me. God's speaking to me. God's trying to get my attention if I'll let it happen. And I wonder, how does he know that? God has spoken to him through the word so he, that he can minister to us through his word. That's that always amazing me. A, a sword that it talks about has two edges. And when it goes in, it cuts going in and it cuts going out. So there's something that lays us open, Brother Shannon, when that sword of the Spirit goes into us, when it spiritually penetrates our heart. Charles Spurgeon said, there is no way to spiritually penetrate the heart of any natural man except by his piercing instrument, which is the Word of God. And the revelation will be revealed to all of us if we allow it to through the Word of God. That soul and spirit speaks of the inner man. What's going on inside me? What's happening in my mind? Brother Larry talked Sunday morning. I went back and, and, and I began to listen to some of his lesson. A hindrance to the harvest. My mind. I battle that. I'll just be honest, honest and open with you. I battle that at times. I'm distracted got a lot going on a lot's happening in my life work's happening we're busy brother Shannon things happening so I battle that I battle that that doubt and I battle I battle that fear but it's something that's going on in my mind but one of the weapons that he lists is the helmet of salvation that we placed it's comforting to know brother Larry that it's there it's comforting to know that what's happening in my life God's got control of it everything's going to be all right my mind will play tricks on me if I allow it to. You ever sat and thought about something and, th and thought about it and thought about it and it just get mad all over? Upset, beside myself. 
and it never come to pass. It never materialized. It never happened. That's my mind playing tricks on me, keeping me occupied when I ought to be focused on God. I've been there. Still go through that. Battled it some this week about this lesson. Sister Rita shared something on Facebook yesterday, and I want to thank her for that, about the Word of God. Because Romans 10 and 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When I hear the Word, my faith is lifted up, Sister Judy. When I hear the Word, I know everything's going to be all right. I know everything's going to be all right. It talks about, it talks about the soul. And that soul is pneuma, and it means our soul inside. Genesis tells us that God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God breathed into our life. All things are open to God's, God's light, sight. Nothing is hidden to him. He sees us as we are, the true creature that we are. We're uncovered, and we're open to him. He realizes, and he sees us as we are. The word translates here, open, translates from the Greek word traklesio. And it's only used here to refer of a wrestler in a grasp. And John Michael, if he was in here, he would understand that he has a hold on him so hard, so hard that he's got the back of his neck. He's got his opponent by the back of the neck, and when he grabs that opponent, he throws him, and he leaves him open so that he can uncover, that, so that he can cover him for the pin. And it speaks that being open before God, it results in victories. It means to overthrow or open to overcome our opponent. And I thought about that. We're open. He sees me as I am. There's nothing that's hidden from him. Nothing that's hidden from him. James 1, 21 and 25 through 25 says, Wherefore, lay apart. And that, in that word there, lay apart, means cast off. Wherefore, cast off all filthiness, filth, and superfluity. That means an abundance of naughtiness and to receive with meekness. And that word meekness, as I've taught before, does not mean shy. It does not mean timid. It does not mean scared. When it talks about meekness in the scripture, it talks about power under control. I'm, I've got everything under control because God has got everything under control. It's not through me, but it's through him. And it says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word. That word doer means a maker or producer and not hearers only. Deceiving your own self, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. That means perceive or observe. For he beholdeth himself, and he goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth himself and what manner of man he is. He takes a look and sees what he wants to see. And then he goes on and he forgets about how, how he is. It says receive with gladness or receive with meekness in James 1 and 21. I want to look at this in James 1 and 21. It says receive with meekness. The engrafted. But Shannon, I begin to look at that and think about that. And I begin to study in the, that word engrafted. It means to include or put together. It means to insert a shoot from one plant into another so that they grow together as one. And I thought about it like this. You're basically putting something together or something into something else that was not created to be there. You're putting something into something else that was not created to be there. You're manipulating it if you will. So it says receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And I begin to I begin to think about that. I begin to think about my heart, Sister Dana. And the Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things. It's sick 
And it's an unbelieving heart, if you will. How can we speak good things? How can we talk about good things when we got an evil heart? The evil person produces evil thoughts. And it says that my heart is evil. That's what Jeremiah, I believe Jeremiah 1 and 17 says that. So if my heart's not right, when the word goes forth, Brother Larry, how am I going to receive it if my heart's not right? You talked about it Sunday morning, I believe, a little bit. The, the heart is described, and I'll, I'll cover here in a minute, the word is described as the seed. And there's four types of soil that the seed goes in. There's the thorny ground. There's the stony ground. There's the ground that they call the wayside. Or there was the good ground. So it's up to us to have my heart right. It's up to us to get my heart right. Ezekiel 36 and 26. And it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from you, from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. So it's up to God to allow him to change my heart, that I might accept his word, that I might take the word to heart and apply it into my life. Beholding his natural face as a glass refers to someone looking at their physical features in a mirror. Now, Jeremiah, when we start talking about the word, Jeremiah described the word as a hammer, and Jeremiah described the word as fire. David said the word is a lamp. The book of Hebrews said the word of God is sharp as a sword. Jesus said the word of God was a seed. And James said the word of God is like a mirror. How many of you looked at the mirror this morning? Some hands raised, some hands not. Why did you look in the mirror for? I looked in the mirror and I brushed my teeth. Yeah, gave yourself a pep talk. I looked in the mirror and I combed my hair. I wanted to see what I looked like, Brother Jerry. I wanted to see what was going on. We look in the mirror to see ourselves as we are. And I'm, I'm going to go into it a little bit, little bit, little bit deeper. Did you like what you see when you looked in the mirror? You don't have to answer that. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. It's just the truth. That's the way it is. That mirror is a reflection of who I am. Now, you're going to have to excuse me just a minute for being a little bit on the carnal side right now. And I think this hits home. The song that I want to share with you, Michael Jackson sang a song that said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. He said, I'm going to make a change. And he was talking about making the world a better place. I mean, the song had a good meaning. It has a good principle to it. But it says, I'm going to make a change for once in my life. It's going to feel real good and going to make a difference. And I'm going to make it right. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. And I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, Take a look at yourself and then make a change. And I thought about that. When I look at the mirror of God, when I look at the Word and I allow it to become a mirror in my life, I see myself, Sister Betty, as I really am. I see the changes that need to be made. Not only do we look at it for the physical aspect of it, but for the spiritual aspect of it. Our world around us becomes better, and our world around us becomes clearer when we allow the mirror of God's Word to begin to change us. And as that happens, guess what? It affects other people. It affects those 
around us because I'm allowing myself to be changed. I can allow other people to see God in me. I can allow and change, have a lasting effect on someone else, Sister Lynn, because I've allowed God to change me. Not only do we read the Bible, but the Bible will also read me. Not only do I read the Bible, but the Bible reads me. Hmm. The Bible has a picture of me. It sees me as I am. As I said a while ago, when the word begins to go forth and the minister begins ministering to his sister Sheila and begins to speak right where we're living at, then that's when the change begins to take place. That's when the change can begin to happen in our life. If I want to see me or the me I'm supposed to be, I just simply look into the word of God. Now think about it like this. When I look into that mirror, and I'm talking about the natural mirror, that mirror does not lie. The mirror shows me as I am. And guess what? Sometimes the mirror can be brutal. Sometimes, Sister Carol, I don't like what I see. Sometimes I don't like what I've become, both physically and naturally. It speaks to me. A mirror does not lie. It can be very brutal. Photo photographers can manipulate an image to make it appear beautiful. They can manipulate it by changing the aspects of it or the color of it. And they can take something that doesn't look so good and they can manipulate it to make it look really good. They can make it look beautiful, if you will. When there's beauty, we take it. And when there's none, we're going to make it. One man takes a casual glance. It talks about beholding. It refers to a person that just glances at the word of God. Someone that's in a hurry. Someone that doesn't really want to take the time to allow God's word to change them. We hear a little bit of it or we see a little bit of it. But I go on my way because I don't want it to change me. I don't want it to make a difference in my life. We run past the mirror and we, we quickly forget what we see. Similar to looking at our watch and forgetting what time it is. Similar to look, looking at my morning devotion. And I've been guilty of this, Brother Shannon. You guys are all so good about sharing things in the morning. And, and, and I get to work early and I, I read them as the day goes on. But sometimes I don't share anything, which I should. But you're so good about sharing your morning devotion, but sometimes it's just a glance over it. Sometimes it's just barely looking at it. Sometimes I'm not taking the time to see what I really, really, really need to see. And we've all been there. I'm not casting stones because I'm guilty just as same as you are. But one of the quotes that I read, it says, God does not reveal much truth to the people who just glance at his word. When I not open Brother Larry, to the understanding of what he's trying to tell me, when I'm not open to the understanding of what he's wanting to show me, we often forget what we read when we just glance at the Word, when we just look at it. If we were asked, does this passage mean anything to us, and we've just glanced at it, we would probably say no, because we didn't fully read it, and we didn't fully understand what God was trying to tell us, what he was trying to to say to us, so to speak. It's something that we've got to, the word is something that we've got to look at deeply. The word is something that we've got to study. And we've got to ask God to open it to us. Sister Maria, you've talked about it. Part of your testimony is that God opened the word to you and revealed the word to you. And I promise you that he will if we study, if we talk to the pastor or we talk among ourselves that that word will be revealed to us to where we can understand it. And when that happens, when it's open to us, when we understand it, it makes a change in our life. It makes a change in our life. This is something that the, the Bible speaks about the, the angels desiring to look into. They want to have what we have. They were created be beings, but they wanted to look in to understand what we have, we need to just do more than just nibble at God's word. 
I've got a, I've got a book by Sister Melanie Shock, and it says, Eat the Word. It talks about eating the Word, becoming the Word, digesting the Word, allowing it to work in our life. We need to sit down and we need to absorb it. We need to look into the Word of God because it's the Word of God or the mirror that reveals to us who we really are. If we look in that mirror, just a crystal in the morning, we see a, our hair all messed up. We see a dirty face. We see our teeth needs to be brushed. We're going to take the time when we're going to fix those problems. Most people will because we want to make it right. We don't want to go out into our place of business or our place of work, and we don't want to look like that. So we take a little time when we fix ourselves up. It's the same thing with God's Word. We need to allow it to make a change in our life. And when we read it, we need to remember what we see. That's, that's why it's important as I'm reading and as I'm studying and as Brother G.L.'s preaching or one of the other ministers are preaching, I've got a notebook and I'm making notes and I'm, and I'm writing things down so I can co- kind of go back to it and understand it and look at it. It's important that we write it down. Sometimes it, my handwriting might not be easy to read, but I can understand what I wrote down. When I do that, I see things that I need to correct, see things that I need to take care of. Psalms 119 and 9 in the New King James Version said, How can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed accordingly to your word? We're cleaned through your word. That way that it speaks about in there is the path of living, the place that I'm taking in the place that I'm going, where, where, I'm, where, where I'm happening at. John 15 and 3 says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And clean is a word which we get our word catharsis from, and that means a purification or cleansing. When I allow that word to cleanse me or I allow that word to purify me, it makes a difference in my life. It does not just clean outwardly, Brother Jerry, but it cleans inwardly. It's how it flows. How, how it flows. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, But we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of of the Lord. The New Living Translation says, so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed. Brother Larry, when I allow that to change me, it makes me look more like Him. It allows me to reflect, Brother Shannon, His glory. It's not just me that people see it's not just my actions that people see it's not just the words that I speak but it's him and my manner and the way that I act and the way that that I present myself because the word is like a mirror I become more like Jesus I become more like him and that's the whole point God's purpose in our life to become more like him The word Christian was first used at Antioch, and it means Christ-like, like like him. I began began to look at this, and I began to study this, and I've got so many notes that I think I've I've skipped over some of them. Because I I make, out out beside it, Brother Shannon, I began to make notes, and some of them I might have overlooked. But the more you look into the Bible, the more you become what you are looking at. The more you look at the Bible, the more you become at what you're looking at. We're changed or we're transfigured. And that word transfigured there speaks of transformed into something that's more beautiful. That's what it means. I'm transformed into something more beautiful when I allow it to change me. We're transfigured by reading the Word. It's the same word that we get the word metamorphosis at. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
I'm changed from one creature to another. Me and Miss Jane talked about this, and I, I, I spoke something about it in elements class one day, and she said she'd done a whole study on it, and I think she's been talking about it, and then she's been teaching on it. So I, I no longer am a caterpillar, Brother Ray. I'm no longer crawling around in the dirt, so to speak, if you will. I'm transfigured or I'm transformed into a beautiful butterfly. Two totally different creatures. Isn't that just amazing how God works? That's in the natural aspect of it, but when I apply to it spiritually, when I allow that metamorphosis to take place, when I'm changed, I'm no longer the old man. Behold, the old man's gone, and I become a new man. And created in Christ Jesus is what the Scripture tells us. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I believe, I become a, a new man. So the more that I look at it, I change forms. I change the person that I am. A metamorphosis is simply the inner nature coming to the surface because the inner man's changed, Sister Nadine. My outer personification should be changed. People should see me differently. And I quoted it earlier, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The word is important. I begin to think about Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it says, This known also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That word perilous means dangerous times shall come. Listen to this and then realize that it's happening in our world that we live in right now. Not only was it applicable to Timothy's time, but it's applicable to the time and day that we live in. I heard this morning there was another school shooting in, I believe, Arlington, Texas. And another student, I believe, shot and injured four people. This is the kind of world that we live in, but perilous times to come. For men shall be lovers of their own self. A, a, a love of money or many other things, if you will, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontentant. That means no self-control. You have no self-control over yourself. Fierce, cruel, despisers or haters of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of good godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. He told Timothy, he said, Timothy, You've got to be on guard for this because there's dangerous times coming. This is a dangerous world. He tells him of the condition and the attitudes of the people at that time. And it's the same thing that's going on as the world that we live in. He said, take heed. Pay attention. You've got to know what's happening. I'm giving you a word of warning, if you will. But then Paul tells Timothy in chapter 3, verse 17 through 14 through 17, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned. His mother and grandmother had poured a great deal into Timothy, Lois, and Eunice, I believe it was, had taught this young man a lot of things. He said, don't forget what's been put into you. Don't forget those things that you're sure of and the things that you have learned. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Timothy, continue doing the things which you have been taught and learned. And the Scriptures of the Word of God will make thee wise and the salvation through faith, which is inspired by God and is profitable. That means it makes us rich. We might not be rich right here, but one of these days we're going to be rich when we make it to heaven. 
for reproof. That's for evidence or conviction, for correction, chastens those he loves. In righteousness, right with God. Notice what it says, in righteousness. The word will do that. It makes me right with God, and it makes me right with man. It sets me on the path that I need to be at and the path that I need to go, that we may be complete or whole with everything that we need at our disposal. I know it says the man of God, but we all are a child of God. It applies to us. It sets us on that right path with everything that we have at our disposable, at disposal, with everything that we have learned. Calvin Coolidge said the foundation of our society and our government rests so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in our country. This kind of stuff's not taught in school anymore. It makes a difference in, the, in America that we live in. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good of the Savior of the world is communicated to us through the book, but for it we could not know right from wrong. These are men of God on which the foundation of our country was established. These were presidents on which our country was established. And we, our world is such a sad state, and I'm not bringing politics into it. Don't get me, don't get me started on any of that. And I, I really try not to talk about any of that. But it's a sad state that the United States is in. And a lot of it is because we have left God and we have forgot God and we don't want to study about God. Ronald Reagan said, of the many influences that have shaped the United States into a distinctive nation and people, none may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. We cannot read of history or the rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible has occupied in shaping the advances of our republic or our nation. Franklin Roosevelt said the fundamental basis of this nation's laws was given to Moses on the mount. The, ten, the Ten Commandments still apply today. There was the civil law, there was the ceremonial law, and there was the moral law. The civil and ceremonial law has been completed. God brought those to completion through Jesus Christ. But the moral law is still in, still in effect today. It's still working today. The fundamental basis of our Bill of Rights came from the teachings we get from Exodus and St. Matthew, from Isaiah and St. Paul. Notice these are presidents that say this. Harry Truman says, if you take out your statutes, your constitution, your family, life all has taken from the sacred book would be there left to bind the society together. Our individual lives have been transformed by the Bible, by the book. It's been transformed. It's been, it's been made do. So I ask you tonight, how important is the word to you? Are we allowing it to change our lives? Are we listening to it? Are we hearing it? Are we applying it? Are we reading about it? Are we studying about it? The word is important. This word is important to all of us here tonight. It's important to all of our lives tonight. It's the only weapon that we're given. When you study the Bible in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and the enemy came to him, Brother Shannon, he defeated him. He was weak. He was a man. He hadn't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights, eaten or drinking anything. So he was at a depleted state, if you will, physically. But he began to quote the Scripture. The devil would throw something at him. He began to quote the Scripture, and he defeated the devil by the Word of God. But the jury, we have that same ability to do that tonight. It's through that word. It's this weapon of the word that we can use and we have it if we allow it to make a change in our life. We allow it to make a difference in our life. Stand with me tonight. I hope that I have said something that's touched someone that has 
made you stop and think. I wrote down at the uh, beginning of my lesson, and I put food for thought. Sometimes I need to be jarred, Brother Shannon. Sometimes I need to be shaken. Sometimes I get it into a rut. And sometimes I need the word to shake me. Sometimes I need the word to motivate me. Sometimes I need the word to move me. And I'm thankful that that happens over this pulpit. That that takes place here. Not only here, but it can take place in my home. It can take place at where I'm at when I allow, Brother Larry, when I allow it to make that change in my life. Do we have any... Do we have any announcements that anybody knows of? Anything that's going on? Anything that needs to be spoken about? Uh, let's not forget about the annual coat drive. I know it'll be here before we know it. This year we'd like to collect at least 40 new coats for foster children. Deadline is November the 14th. Uh, I guess the Goodwill Night is October the 16th at, at Poppy's. We talked about it, about buying clothes for your Spouse and them buying clothes for you and y'all going out and having a good time or us going out and having a good time. So, I'll tell you what, I just, I love God tonight. I, I love his word and I love everything that he's doing at River Bend Pentecostal. He's, he's good to us, Brother Cody. Brother Larry, will you dismiss us in prayer tonight, brother?